past and present lift off together as we get off the ground with a story about flight. You know what that means? Flight days are awesome! I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10. Right now, NASA has several active missions to Mars, orbiting the planet, observing the planet, roving the planet. The most recent arrival is the $2.7 billion Perseverance mission. It's got a drone helicopter on board that's carrying a piece of human history. First, the helicopter. It's called Ingenuity. It's about two and a half feet tall, weighs four pounds, and costs $23 million to develop. It's not carrying any scientific instruments. Ingenuity's purpose is to see if powered helicopter flight is possible on the Red Planet. And NASA says it won't do that until at least April 8th because the chopper has to undergo a series of tests before it can try to lift off. If that works though, besides making history, the drone is also carrying it. It's got a tiny piece of the right flyer aboard. This is the first powered and controlled airplane that people ever built. In 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright flew four separate flights on Flyer 1 near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. In contrast to the small Ingenuity drone, the Wright Flyer had a wingspan of more than 40 feet and a length of more than 21 feet. It was built from wood, canvas, aluminum, steel, and iron, and it weighed 605 pounds. As a sort of tribute to that flight, scientists took a bit of fabric that covered the Wright Flyer's wings, a small piece the size of a postage stamp, and attached it to a cable underneath the Ingenuity drone's solar panel. It's not the first time NASA has done this for a space flight. In 1969, a piece of the Wright Flyer's wing fabric and a splinter of wood from the historic aircraft was traveling aboard the Apollo 11 mission when it flew to the moon and back. Back on solid but sodden ground, many people in the eastern Australian state of New South Wales are looking forward to a partly cloudy weekend forecast. The weather systems that brought tremendous rain and record-breaking floods to the state have moved into the Tasman Sea. But the threat hasn't gone away for some communities as the high waters continue to flow through river systems and keep certain areas flooded for the time being. Australia is no stranger to severe weather, but this week's flooding sent spiders scurrying into homes, snakes slithering into trees, and waterfalls emerging in historic and dry landscapes. Hey Carl, this is one of my favorite parts of the week, getting to research some of the most beautiful and interesting places around the world to take you and our friends here at CNN 10. So for today's virtual field trip, I am taking you all the way to the land down under, to the spiritual center of Australia. Welcome to Uluru. It's known around the world for its ever-changing red hues against the backdrop of Australia's central desert, a desert which is usually extremely dry. But this week, after heavy rains poured throughout northern Australia for nearly a week, this incredible and rare footage emerged of waterfalls at Uluru. Stacey McGregor, who works for a local tour company, posted these images to her Facebook and told CNN that she's lived and worked in Uluru for over four years and she's never seen waterfalls or rain like this. The area typically receives around 13 inches of rainfall in an average year, but recorded nearly two inches on Sunday and Monday of this week alone, according to the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Uluru is one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Standing at 1,142 feet high, it's taller than the Eiffel Tower. For decades, people around the globe would come here to climb this incredible natural structure, but this is no easy hike. Weather here is punishingly hot, and the landscape is often quite windy and slippery. At least 35 people have died here since climbing started in the 1950s. But only a lucky few people have been able to visit Uluru recently, as tourists have been prohibited from actually climbing the sacred site since 2019. The Anangu Aboriginal people, part of the native population of Australia, said it was being destroyed by tourists, permanently wearing down its surface and polluting nearby water holes. Here's to hoping the glory of Uluru will be preserved for generations to come. Back to you, Carl. 10 second trivia. According to the United Nations, 31% of the Earth's land area is covered by what? Forests, deserts, lakes, or ice? Though deserts cover about a third of the land, forests cover just under that at 31%. Deforestation and reforestation are next today. The major cause of forest reduction in South America is the intentional clearing of land. This can be done for wood, to expand cities or road projects, or to develop more farmland. 
The Atlantic Forest, which runs from northeast Brazil down the country's east coast into Paraguay and Argentina, covers only a fraction of the land it once had, but a conservationist is working to reconnect some of its fragments. What I really love about being in a forest is seeing the size of the change we can really make. Is it really possible to bring all that forest back? Laurie Cullen has dedicated his life to restoring the Atlantic forest in Brazil after witnessing the destruction of his birthplace. The Western Sao Paulo Atlantic Forest Range used to be a very you know, green, continuous, beautiful landscape. What used to be 100% of forest cover now is only 2%. Decades of deforestation have led to a significant reduction of one of the world's most diverse habitats. All that remains of the forest are isolated fragments. This means many species are now under threat as they no longer have the ability to disperse. The wildlife, uh, especially you know, jaguars, pumas, ocelots, they are very isolate in small forest patches. They cannot see each other. That's when we started having problems of inbreeding depression that can kill the local population in a very short term. Cullen and his team use a targeted approach to forest restoration, taking what's left of the fragments and planting in corridors. These proposed corridors aim to connect the fragments and act almost like an express highway for local species. The dream app is putting priorities where, where the forest should really be to make sure we put the right corridors in the right places. To date, Cullen and his team have restored 3,000 hectares of forest and tell us they have already seen at least half of native species using them, including some animals at most risk of extinction. Today, it's already possible to see the lion tamarins, the, the families of this little monkey, by themselves using some of the forest corridors that we have put back. If we just keep on going, the survival of this very endangered species will be okay in the long term. Cullen is motivated by both the community and climate benefits to reforestation, but his accomplishments represent a transformation that is as much personal as it is philanthropic. If you give an aspiring engineer enough PVC pipe, 2x4s, sandbags and cinder blocks, and then you let him work for a few weeks, it's amazing what he can build. At least, it is if he's Ben Tolliday, a Georgia student who constructed a thrill ride in his backyard. We don't know how much the materials cost, but we do know it works and that his mother is proud, though she says she's looking forward to getting her yard back. It won't be to her amusement and she will not find it thrilling if he dips, dives, turns, rolls out and coasts off to college while leaving a construction project on track in her yard. He may ask, why wouldn't you want it? But if she's steeled in her determination not to have her yard marred by a twisted venture, she may not let that train leave the station until the coaster's cleared. Shout out to Antilles High School today. The Pirates are watching in Fort Buchanan, Puerto Rico. Have a great weekend, everyone. I'm Coral Azus for CNN.